Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Grandma brushes and buttons my wool coat, presses daddy's handkerchief into my palm. Dr. Gaudet says I'll be all right. No harm will come, the cure will take. Father Roque nods, his hand on my head in blessing, promises I can listen to prayers on the radio. A knock on the door, kids yell, Aggie, you coming? There's a snowball fight. The room falls quiet while President Wilson reassures the nation. The sanatorium at Wallam Lake, I know three people here and one who isn't who have um, had relatives connected with uh, Wallam Lake or the Fresh Air School. Um, yeah, I know Doris, your mother. Yeah, I know. Um, children had to, large, in large families, had to, um, some of the children would have to live with in other people's houses, preferably with relatives, but sometimes not. Um, Pete, I'd like to pass pictures around of Wallam Lake Sanatorium. These, this is mid-century. These are not um, exactly of this time, but there is something to be said that there was a great society there. And again, the DVD by G. Wayne Miller and Betancourt, In a Distant Place, Life and Love on the Lake, tells you not only the scope of the crusade, for a cure for TB, but it shows Wallam Lake in the most intimate way. Um, the sanatorium was indeed a distant place. It was a half-day train trip for Aggie from Pawtucket. Um, they had their own train station at the sanatorium. They had their own post office. They had their own printing shop for printing Wallam Lake postcards. Um, Wallam is the Algonquin name uh, believed to reference the word um, a beautiful place. Alum, something that sounds like alum in Algonquin language. It was both a self-sufficient 250-acre farm and a, cont a contagion hospital offering the rest cure and open-air treatment. When it opened in 1905, TB was the leading cause of death. Half of those infected died within five years. 10,000 patients were admitted to Wallam Lake between 1905 and 1930. Many improved, but dealt with lifelong relapses. Strengthening the body's defenses against the bacillus was considered curative in the early 1900s, and that would look like strictly regulated rest and very gradual progressive exercise, uh, medical supervision and the healthy air, three square meals and uh, a glass of milk every four hours for what it's worth. <laughs> that was considered curative. Once the antibiotic streptomycin was introduced, or at least widely available in the 1950s, outcomes improved. Until that time, there was no other um, recourse. There were about three levels um, that I know of, of privilege for a patient at Wallam Lake. Aggie is, uh, we have her, at the higher level of privilege. The first two would be absolute bed rest with a bedpan, partial bed rest with bathroom privilege, then moving to porch, porch sitting in the recliners, gradually more walking than sitting, um, and then class three privileges. Fever gone and lesion free, doing well without medicine to keep her pulse down, Aggie advances to class three light occupation and walks on grounds. She's gathering strength. Things are looking up. Come June, her grandmother will take her home in time to make her first communion. 
For now, she enjoys Sunday visits to the henery, the milking shed, the plow horse in his field, the dank scent of the piggery when the wind blows just right. She likes things sealed in, so caps jelly jars with paraffin, spools the clothesline out and in, strength, straightens the pins, helps the milkman unload his wagon, taking care of the bottles don't jiggle and unclots the cream solid on the top, helps the cook for special celebrations turn pineapple upside down cakes right side up. <laughs> Grandma's house. I can't go back home yet, although I'm well again. Mom has the twins to care for, worries our tenement is overcrowded, and fever germs might get me. So Grandma took me in. At first, her mini mouse shoes scared me, her ticking clocks, the bookcase, so white, so quiet. I feel like an elephant in a china shop, visiting poodles made of glass. I'm not ready for school. But will be soon, the man says, who comes to check my fever graph and spit. So I stay home in color, mum's voice in my head. Don't run, Aggie. Don't laugh. If you cough, they're going to put you back in again. Twice a week, mum visits after work. She's sad. So I try not to cry or be scolded for acting like the child I don't feel like at all. She hugs me hard, says I'm helping her and my twin sisters too by staying here a while. I'm getting to know every window and latch, the way the crocheted curtains sway and cast their lacy shadows on the floor, the arrangement of bone china in the hutch, which teacups have chips, and how to place them out of view when company comes. One is mine, paper thin but strong, and how long the kettle purrs before it sings louder, 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 and I can pour. I think we're going to say goodbye to Aggie now. <clears throat> Are you ready for more positivity posters? <laughs> The superintendent, superintendent pins up more positivity posters, but it's going to get dark after this. Important announcement. Company picnic, June 30th, Sales Bleachery Field, Lincoln. Come say hello to the Red Cross after you've had your fill of ham and beans, strawberry shortcake, and softball. Positivity poster on every bulletin board. TB is contagious. We will fight germs with enthusiasm. Remember, positivity is contagious. Be enthusiastic. Stay positive. Positivity poster in the weaving room. Before another man is lost, before another child sickens, our factory will do its part, and together we'll make a difference. The cotton manufactured into the prettiest calico cloth here had to come from somewhere, right? Um, King's, King Cotton's reach was vast, so the, the book does travel into the South because we, our goods, especially during the time, the Civil War era, uh, we were very dependent on slave-grown Southern cotton. So the book delves into the racial, Rhode Island's racial past, and that is not so inspiring. Um, <clears throat> Lords of the Loom, Lords of the Lash. The beatings, the cleaning of flax and cotton, the carding engine, pulling cotton through teeth to comb it, grooming the fibers for spinning into yarn, stretching, twisting, spinning yarn into thread, wound onto spools, then unwound again to make the warp. The weaving of the cloth, the bringing together of warp and weft, the weaving, the unweaving, the Civil War, 
threatens good slave-grown southern cotton and cotton fever, the hunger for calico and profit raging in the north. For King Cotton, an unholy union forms, planters and fleshmongers of the south, textile magnets of the north, mill owners, fleshmongers, the lords of the loom and the lords of the lash, the engine of freight and cash, feeding the country's insatiable need for printed cloth, printed money. Like a train, like hounds in pursuit, this mill machine and field army, once set in motion, will never be stopped nor abolished, vow the lords of the loom and the lords of the lash. I think Stephen Dunwell, an author of, um, and a historian of the mills, for the phrase, Lords of the Loom, Lords of the Lash, I'm not sure he originated it, but that's where I found it. So, <clears throat> Heavy traffic. Dark water circles ceaselessly. Ships slip northward on amnesia, full of tobacco, cotton, denial bound for enlightened providence, the mouth of the bay, the jaws of the cotton mill, the teeth of the cotter and comber. Dock water circles ceaselessly. Ships turn south under the menace of storm clouds filled with new bright cloth, spools of thread, dry goods, then call at Bristol for silver, fine furniture, northern timber for ships, barrels of rum and bread from South County, and on to Connecticut's wharfs, groaning with ivory, tusks once carried by African slaves, now bleached and milled into hair combs, billiard boards, billi billiard balls, trinkets, but most of all in steamer trunks, piano keys, silent. I would like to end with a, a landscape poem. Back to the Fresh Air Summer School. Back to the Fresh Air School. This is Summer School, 1911. Uh, I have the Algonquin words for the um, names for the Blackstone here. And I have a reference to the Galveston Giant, who is Jack Johnson, the uh, first African-American heavyweight champion. Um, there is disparaging, uh, a disparaging um, moniker here. It's in the voice of the times, the children. Fresh Air Summer School, 1911, Don't Tread on Me. <coughs> Their summer school cots placed side by side become a tribal lodge, pale-faced, sickly, doesn't stop them leaping back and forth, swinging clubs and tomahawks, aiming bow and arrow to pierce another redskin's heart and earn a stripe of war paint, the right to pass the peace pipe, puff and talk about Tonto, the Lone Ranger, his white horse, and Jack Johnson, world heavyweight champ, the first darky prize fighter, coming to Pawtucket for the fourth jubilee. They puff and tell stories about the Galveston giant and wonder, who'll raise the battle flag? Who'll raise the battle flag? Don't tread on me. The River Blackstone, Kittacock, Sneechtaconnet, below them, sunning like a lazy snake. And my final uh, poem, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, the, the title and the last line are a reference to Wallace Stevens' poem, Sunday Morning. And, um, the Blackstone River, once the most polluted in America, is it still the newest national historical park? Um, so onward, onward. Um, Sunday afternoon. Sunday strollers on the promenade. The factories closed. The river almost blue, almost river-like. The river bank as it should be, elms not yet sickened green thickness of willows. Mallards strut, iridescent, sun turtles shine in the muck, and eel glides luminous past boys fishing for pickerel in the shallows. 
Upstream, children build rafts of sticks to watch them drift off, break a pot on the lip of Pawtucket Falls. A father and son skipping stones, circles ripple one into the other as evening comes. Tomorrow, the violence again. The river goes crazy with color. The mills spew into the black stone. It's said you can tell what the mills are doing each day by the color of the river. Mustard, vermilion, lime green, magenta on Thursdays. Branding and burning the river. Heavy, heavy metals, dyes, varnishes, solvents, bleach, and a dark red poison to kill the cottonseed bug. A hot effluent slop rages seaward 48 miles from Quinsigamon to Seekonk with all the waste that perverts this river, all the measures destined for her soul. Thank you. At the time that these, most of these poems reflect, and also this picture, which is Lily Hines, the medical establishment had a term for the, the, the kinds of diseases we're talking about, which is called diseases of life, which TB was one, malaria was one. Uh, uh, they can think of all the infectious diseases that are out there. We talk about, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the, a little bit of the history in terms of uh, occupational health, which was diseases of work, and the diseases of life, which is the general uh, concept of infectious disease, communicable disease. Communicable disease, obviously, uh, you, you, when we think about there's this period of time, smallpox was very active. It killed maybe half a million to, to two million people a year, every year, until it was conquered in the 1960s. Malaria, a chronic uh, disease of life. Childbirth, a chronic disease of life. Cholera, a chronic disease of life. The separation between diseases of life and diseases of occupation was begun in the same period when, the, uh, when physicians and medical authorities began to look at the occupational situation of workers. Now, obviously, many people at work got a disease of life. They may have not got it at work, but they had it at work. And the relationship between that and the general diseases of life, you know, is very tight and intertwined. But as the expansion, explosions expansion of the, the industrial society that we see today, <clears throat> when you realize oil was discovered in the 1870s in Pennsylvania, and, and by 1910, we had an enormous petrochemical industry established throughout the world, uh, which also influenced the development of the chemist, chemical industry, which also in influenced the development of, of the uh, rubber industry, the automobile industry, the entire development of new materials, new structures to build buildings with and pave roads with came as a result of a massive expansion between, say, 1860 in 1920, when we just transformed the planet completely. Um, that was accompanied by an awareness of the fact that, you know, workers who were working in these industries could be exposed to some nasty stuff, and of course they were. Uh, the Greeks also, the Greeks and the Romans also understood there were certain occupations that had deleterious effects on people, mostly the mining industries, and also the quarrying industries where people were exposed to silica and silicosis, and got silicosis. In the mining industries, there was a classic example of exposures to particulate matter, uh, coal, coal miner, uh, black lung and white lung. White lung often referred to either asbestosis and or uh, bisonosis, uh, uh, which was the classic disease of the textile workers, which is the fibers in, being inhaled into the body, into the lungs. Now, communicable diseases tend to be, the agent tends to be a biological entity of some type, a bacteria, a virus, uh, any, any biologically active form of life that can in, get into the body, usually through inhalation or usually through fluid, some sort of fluid in, in, intake into the body. The classic occupational health and occupational disease approach was to look at physical and chemical hazards and how they impacted workers. 
So from the period when we're talking about in terms of 1910, 1920 to the enormous expansion that went through, especially generated by, uh, by the two world wars, the chemical industry blossomed in enormous expansion in both world wars. It uh, had associations with the development of the uh, paint industry, had associations with the development of all kinds of material that was new and dramatic and based on new technology, the metal, metal plating, you know, epoxies, all kinds of chemical products that were fused together with the development, for example, of the automobile. The automobile propelled the development of the rubber industry, which was huge, which was huge, um, because you had to have tires, and, and rubber, rubber also became part of pharmaceuticals, became part of uh, plastic development. So in these conditions, the focus in the occupational health domain and the occupational uh, and the occupational medicine domain was the impact of these chemical or physical hazards on workers and what they what, the, what kind of impact they had on their health. The so from the period from 19 roughly 1910 to up until recently, that field that subset which is the occupational health and environmental health as well, but the occupational health, environmental health focused more on the physical and chemical hazards <coughs> and did very little, paid very little attention to biological hazards. This dramatically changed in the 1980s with the explosion of the HIV epidemic, the AIDS epidemic, where clusters of an unusually disease occurred and all of a sudden spread thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people being sick by a devastating disease which is HIV. The impact it's had on the occupational health uh, uh, and occupational medicine, the subset, was enormous. Uh, one, because it, the numbers were catastrophic and it still was not known what, what was causing it. And number two, it impacted the health care industry dramatically. Healthcare workers are the first line workers that deal with people with HIV. And at this point in time, in the 1960s, it was also the beginning of a strong unionization movement in the healthcare industry. So we had unions organizing in hospitals, in nursing homes, that were providing workers a voice, some power, a basis of power, to raise issues of concern to them. And one of them was, you know, how am I as a nurse or a physician or, 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 or even a custodian in the hospital protected from this disease which is ravaging us in which I have to treat the people that are coming into the hospital or into the nursing home. So the, power, the, the ability for workers to exercise some power in this situation, plus the absolutely dramatic uh, explosion of, of scientific, uh, when you think about it, the, 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 the fact that from 1983, 80, 45, we didn't know what was happening with HIV. Within 10 years, we had a complete knowledge of what it was and how to deal with it. It's an amazing public health uh, achievement. Uh, and I think part of it reflected the fact that um, it affected the industry a lot of these people worked in. And people who did this research were also healthcare workers. So with the, the advent of the, the impact of HIV, it changed the whole focus of occupational and environmental health as a result of that. Uh, when the Na OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, was passed in 1970, they um, had to begin with a set of rules. And what they went to was they went to the, 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 basically the, the recommendations by the American National Hygiene Association, American Council of Occupational Physicians. And they took the rules that they had developed a lot of them during the Second World War, because at that point in the Second World War, they were interested in protecting their workers because they wanted them to, to be able to, to work in the factories and make the tanks and the planes. So there was an interest in worker health, and they developed a lot of standards and rules about how to protect workers, mostly, again, again from physical hazards and chemical hazards. So when OSHA developed its rules and regulations, the OSHA standards, there was not a single one that addressed uh, infectious communicable disease. It was all based on physical hazards and chemical hazards. So 1980, AIDS epidemic occurs. 
there's a, 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 a powerful now alternative to the decision making in the, in, in, in the healthcare industry, which is the unions there. And, and there becomes the first occupational health standard, the bloodborne pathogen standard, that address communicable disease, which is an important and a major imp important victory for workers and also for the, the patients they were treating. There was a comorbidity at that time as well, which was hepatitis B, which also infected uh, uh, healthcare workers far more than most, uh, most other occupations. It was clearly an occupational disease, and when they discovered what it was causing it, which is a hepatitis B virus, they, the bloodborne pathogen standard that was passed in the 1980s, it was enacted in the 1980s, addressed that as well. So, for example, there, became, there was a vaccine, a successful vaccine, 99% successful vaccine against hepatitis B. So the bloodborne pathogen standard said not only do you have to protect workers from bloodborne pathogens like AIDS, you have to protect, protect them from bloodborne pathogens like hepatitis B and hepatitis C, which at that point we didn't know anything about and didn't have any treatment for. But we did for B, which was the vaccine, 99% for sexual. So the OSHA standard said work, healthcare workers have to, get the vac have to be vaccinated against hepatitis B. That's, again, a major public health victory. Lo and behold, within, by eight, the late 80s and 90s, a, a new occurrence in healthcare. Again, the focus of a, of a lot of where this impetus to, to look at communicable diseases is coming from, which is this multi-drug resistant TB. A lot of healthcare workers had TB, but it could be, like in 1955, you've had TB, you could be treated, and you could be successfully treated with the, uh, with the antibiotics that were available. By 1989, there was multi-drug resistant TB. The antibiotics weren't working. This, again, created a huge fusion and tension and interest in terms of protecting the workers in the, in the healthcare field from this multi-drug resistant TB form. And once again, there was a, an elaborate development of rules and regulations, not from OSHA, but from actually from the Centers for Disease Control. So here is how you protect your workers from multi-drug resistant TB. Coincidentally to that, of course, was the, by 1970, in the late 70s, was the 50th anniversary of the pandemic flu in, uh, outbreak in 1918. Flu kills 30, 80,000 people, 80,000 worldwide, maybe 10 to 30 in the United States every year, at periodic, as we go through. The, the pandemic flu ki killed 30 million people in 1918. And so in the late 70s, there's a lot of attention, media attention, to this event that 50 years ago happened, and could it happen again? And they would interview, you know, infectious disease experts, and they said, sure, it's going to happen again. <laughs> so I was this, oh. <laughs> this created a major, major international structure to surveillance for pandemic flu events. And as we've seen periodically, there's the flu virus mutates. Uh, it, especially in agricultural environments, Southeast Asia, in China, new strains would come out. And these new strains would be, the vaccines that we have for influenza were less effective against that, some of the new strains. And so the international health community was very much interested in finding out what, where it's coming from and what they could do to, to, to develop a vaccine that could effectively deal with it. At the same time, there are events in the geopolitical realm, which were which were the, the threat of bioterrorism. So in the early 90s, we invade Iraq, and the potential for an, a response occurs. And Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.